Hello and welcome to another Securities Lending Saturday. I'm Roy Zimmerhansel and today we're going to be talking about exchange traded funds and how they intersect with securities lending. So if securities finance is your thing, you'll be interested in the six different ways that it interacts with securities finance and ETFs. And so I suggest you stick around and let's get to it. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to another Securities Lending Saturday. I'm Roy Zimmerhansel. I'm the host, and I will be talking to you today about exchange-traded funds, as I said. This is part two of what I think is a two-part series. You never know about a third one. I had a bunch of questions come in. I think I've answered many of those uh, in today's presentation, but who knows? We'll see where we go from here. So let me put up my slide deck. Hope you're all having a great Saturday so far. If you're in uh, the U.S. and the East Coast, we get a lot of viewers from there. So it's just morning time. So I hope you're having a good day. If you're in the U.K., you're probably freezing like me. It's been uh, sunny but cold the last few days today. Not quite so sunny. But that's why I'm inside with you to talk about securities lending as I do every Saturday. <clears throat> For those of you who aren't familiar with it yet, we do the whole show live on LinkedIn, then cut it back to the first 10 minutes, and the full edited video will be available on our YouTube channel tomorrow at 3 p.m. UK time. I'll just flip up the channel right there. You can have a look at it. This is what we are talking about today. Next week, I'm finding myself on the Polish-Ukrainian border, <clears throat> working with uh, Go Darmic, the charity that I'm that I support and am, am part of. Uh, so I'll be going uh, out to the border to help out. So I won't be doing a, a video, a live video. I will see if I can try and record something during the and post it up on Sunday as usual. But again, I'm going out later this week, so I'm not certain how much time I'll have, but I'll do my best. So the next live show will be two weeks today. So today is session 43. So I'm going to talk a little bit about short interest because someone asked a, a, a question about that. And then I'll talk a little bit more about physical versus synthetic ETFs, because again, that was a question that came up in last week's show. And then I'm going to go over six different areas of overlap between ETFs and securities finance. Remember, this is uh, just my opinion, my views. This is for information and hopefully a little bit of entertainment. Always seek advice from a professional before acting in financial markets, because that makes sense. Look, I want to thank everyone that uh, continues to support the channel. I really appreciate that. That's what uh, keeps me going and keeps me producing these. So thanks for that. If you like this video or previous videos, if we give you value, it helps us for if you give us a thumbs up. It also lets me know which episode get the most support so I can concentrate more future content on those specific areas. If you want to see every new video that I put up, whether it's shown on LinkedIn Live, like it won't be next week, uh, or if I just post it up, then what you can do is just subscribe. So that's it for the pitch. This is what we're going to talk about. We're going to do the mandatory Coca-Cola non-advert because they aren't paying, so it can't be an advert. Okay, there was a question about shorting and short interest on ETFs. <clears throat> so first of all, since ETFs are effectively just securities, you can short an ETF in the same way that you would any other sort of stock or bond. And so if a stock uh, price goes down a dollar and you have a short position in an ETF, you'll go up a dollar. It's really a one, one to one connection. If obviously with any short sale, you have counterparty risk, you have the cost of borrowing. And the biggest issue is that you have an unlimited loss potential because if you buy an ETF for $10, the worst thing that can happen is it can go to zero and you can lose the $10 you invested. If on the other hand, you short an ETF, 
and it goes from $10 to $20, you've lost a hundred. But if it goes to $30, you've lost 200% there. It, exactly the same as shorting any other position, which is why shorting isn't the opposite of going long, where again, all you can lose is the amount you've invested. And so in this graph, the effectively the main index, we're saying that it, the index started at 100, it drops $10 one day, goes up $10 the next day, drops 10 and goes back and forth. So the <clears throat> shorting an ET will be the opposite of that. So you end up effectively in both cases in exactly the same position that you were, if we forget about costs, cost of borrowing. So it's really, it is the opposite of what happens with the underlying asset. Now, if you're in an inverse ETF, as I said, that's another way to get short exposure, but it tends to be used tactically because what these ETFs do is they rebalance the position every day based on performance. So on day one, it's a 10% loss, right? A 10% loss on the index. That means that it's a 10% gain for that ETF. So on day one, it's equivalent. But then when it rebalances, if it goes down um, $10 again, then the ETF shorting it, just shorting it like a stock, it goes down $10. But all of a sudden you have $10 off of 110. So you have a larger percentage shift there. So the amount that it actually has made as the stock index rises the next day, it goes up $10 over 110, it starts to diverge because it's a daily percentage calculation on the shift in performance each day. So by the end of six days of this, you have quite a wide variation there. Now, obviously those are very extreme moves, but if I did 1% or 2% changes, you wouldn't actually be able to see it on a chart. Just remember that inverse ETFs are a daily rebalancing of performance and it's a percentage rather than an absolute number. And so over time, it diverges from a short position. So these are not equivalent positions. Shorting the ETF is not the same as holding a short an inverse or short ETF because the shorting an ETF itself just moves in line with the dollar or pound or whatever currency the ETF is in. It moves in line with that every day. Whereas when you have an inverse or short ETF, it's percentages of movement that's rebalanced every single day. So every day you start again at zero and it's about the percentage movement. Okay. So it, it does diverge. So that's a little bit about short interest. <clears throat> The other question that came up was physical versus synthetic ETFs. I did touch on it briefly. So a physically replicated ETF is where the ETF's underlying assets are representative of the index that it's tracking or whatever, whatever index or whatever benchmark it's tracking. And it might be fully replicating. So an S&P 500 or a FTSE 100 or Eurostoxx 50 would hold 50 or 100 or 500 stocks. They'd hold the entire index. And that way they're guaranteed to get the performance of all the underlying securities, but it carries additional costs and workload and administration. So you have some that are optimized <clears throat> where they take a subset of the index that generates, in their view, a, a sufficient, uh, replicable example of what the performance is so that they can say we are tracking this index and we have enough assets in that underlying pool of securities to be certain that we are very close to the tracking the performance of that benchmark and then you can have even a smaller subset which is sampled sampled etfs where you would actually look at it and say look these uh, 10 or 5 or 20 stocks represent 90% of the performance of that index. And so we're going to save the expenses of managing and running the wider portfolio because by holding a small number of securities, we can get effectively the performance of the index. So there's different ways of doing it, but look, the bottom line is that these ETFs hold the underlying securities or a subset of the index they're tracking. Whereas the synthetic ETF, <clears throat> which I talked about, it's actually holding synthetic. So derivative contracts support it. Now, the <clears throat> these may be securities that they're tracking. So again, another index. And you might use that in the event where it's difficult for non-residents to go in. I, I think I mentioned that swaps 
often are used to go into markets where it's either difficult or challenging to go into a, an emerging market in particular, where maybe there are investor constraints about getting into the market or getting assets out of the market, it's easier to track with an index. Chinese exposure was often tracked with swaps in the first place. So now this ETF uh, issuer goes to a swap providers and say, I would like you to give me the performance of this index or that index. There's two different kinds of ways that it gets supported. One is funded, one's unfunded. Don't worry too much about that. But fundamentally, what the ETF issuer is relying on is for the swap writer to generate the performance of the index. And because they are uh, generating just derivative contracts, and remember, derivatives are really just contracts that are based on performance of underlying assets that both parties agree to track, that it'd be very clear that it's they're obliged to provide the performance of the index. So it's not like they have to replicate it. They just have to pay the equivalent amount of money. So in that sense, it's easier to target the index performance. Now, of course, off of that, there are additional fees that the ETF issuer has to pay, which cover the financing costs, because usually what happens is the swap writer will need to hedge themselves in the market. So they need to actually replicate that position. So really it's, <coughs> it's just shifting the burden or the onus from the ETF issuer to hold the underlying portfolio to the swap writer. Okay. Now, whether you're looking at physically replicated ETFs or you're looking at synthetic derivative ETFs, the risks that you need to look at are very much the same. Now, <clears throat> they aren't at, always at the same level or they aren't always uh, direct or they might be indirect exposures, but they do. So let me give you some examples. So the risk that you need to consider in both of them is that, of course, with a derivative contract, your counterparty, you're relying on them to actually pay you the performance of the index. So if they fail or they fail to do that, you have a counterparty exposure. And so that's very clear risk. So you need to be looking at <clears throat> for a synthetic ETF, is the issuer relying on maybe their pa parent company to write them the swap contract? That's obviously a problem because if the parent gets into trouble or organizationally that firm's in trouble, that's probably not a great situation. But if instead they have multiple swap providers, then again, that's a little bit less risk. So you might say in the physically replicated ETFs, well, there's no counterparty risk because the ETF buys the assets and just holds them. Well, that's true, unless of course they do securities lending, in which case they do have underlying counterparty exposure because they're relying on those counterparties to return the ETF assets as and when required. So don't just assume that the swaps are riskier than other ETFs, the, the physical versus synthetic. You need to look at it. <clears throat> Another example might be the collateral. Again, if the ETF, the physically backed one is doing securities lending, they'll be holding collateral. What's their collateral policy? What are they actually holding? What's the over collateralization? This, the swap providers will provide collateral. There's a couple of different ways based on the different structure. But again, they'll be providing collateral. And again, you want to understand what the collateral is, what the degree of over collateralization is, uh, and uh, really understand whether the assets are in any way related to the index or whether they really are just a safety net, which you'd have to dispose of in the event that your counterparty fails, either for securities lending from a physically backed one or to satisfy the contracts in the derivative one. The performance, of course, uh, is fundamental. You're buying these instruments to generate performance. So you need to see how that gets generated. So a fully replicating one definitely will provide the performance of the index, but what's the net after cost performance optimized? Again, fewer expenses, but do they really track the index as closely as you would hope for? Uh, and then the swap providers, again, what are the costs and fees and charges involved in getting those contracts written? So performance is clear. And the other thing which I would say is disclosure now is much better than it was. 
uh, swap providers, in fact, led the uh, charge to providing transparency into their funds in terms of who the swap providers are, in terms of what the collateral is, and keeping it much more updated. I think the securities lending part of the ETFs has gotten better as far as disclosure, but in many cases, it is not as frequent and not as clear. So don't just assume one is safe, one is dodgy. You really need to do your research into both. Okay. I think that's all I'm going to talk about with physical versus synthetic. Just a couple of things. Hello to Nilesh again, who's asked if I can look at something on buy-in risk. Um, I can do, I need to think about that because <clears throat> securities lending obviously generates buy-in risk. But obviously in the wider context, there's buying risk in many markets and structurally regulators quite like having buy-ins because it provides an economic incentive to settle trades on time, not to have false positions like naked short sales and acts as a discipline into the market. So the wider picture I think is important. Then we can drill down to securities lending. So I think it's a good suggestion. Let me think about that. And Fanny, always great to, uh, always great to hear from you. I sent you an email, just <laughs> don't answer this now, but I sent you an email or a, a LinkedIn message a couple of weeks ago. Just let me know what you think. Anyway, good to talk to you and, and good to uh, have you with me again. <clears throat> Operational risk in securities lending is another good uh, suggestion, Nilesh. So uh, you've got to, you win the prize today for most good suggestions. Thanks. Okay. Last week, when I talked about ETFs and their relevance to securities lending, I was really saying there were two levels of it. One was the ETFs themselves as regular securities in the market, which could be loaned out or borrowed and short sold but also the underlying assets, the sort of idea, the layers of the assets underlying that ETF. And those are the two. In reality, there's actually more than that. I just didn't want to complicate things last week. So I've identified six potential areas. So we'll talk about those. Right down the middle is exactly what, what we talked about. One is lender lending the underlying assets of the physical ETFs and lending the ETFs shares into the market themselves. But of course, there are two other aspects to it. One is the create to lend, which I'll talk about. And then finally, ETFs as collateral, which to me is really the linchpin that increases activity across the board more dramatically for ETFs in securities lending, which I'll, I'll talk about. There's also two potential areas. When I was talking about the physical, sorry, the synthetic ETFs, there is pledged collateral for funded ETFs and regular collateral securities or cash, probably securities that go into the unfunded ones. And what you have therefore is you potentially have these pools of assets available to be loaned out. Now, a couple of things. Number one, if collateral is pledged, and you have been paying attention to previous videos of mine, you will know that pledged collateral doesn't involve a transfer of title. And if there's no transfer of title, then the receiver of that collateral isn't legally able to use those securities because they don't own them yet. A pledge still belongs to the party that provided those securities and remains theirs unless some element of the contractual arrangements have been breached. So they go into default, whether that's a default organizationally or a mini default where they just default on a particular transaction. So that legally just isn't able to be used anyway. So if the counterparty defaults and then you take ownership of it, then it's no longer collateral. It's your assets and you can do with it as you please. In theory, there is the possibility for the collateral that the ETF issuer receives from the swap writer, it's possible for them to lend it out in theory. Okay. So let's just go back. So this entity here for these kind of swaps, the unfunded swaps, it is theoretically possible for the ETF issuer to take those securities and lend them out because they're the legal owner of them. Now, practically, they don't really do that, and they don't do that for a couple of reasons. Number one, the uh, swap writer 
usually has the right to substitute that collateral. So uh, a lender wouldn't, yeah, you wouldn't want to lend out an asset and then the swap provider says, oh, I need that piece back. And now you have to cancel the loan to get it back. So operationally, functionally, it's a bit of a challenge, but more realistically, there's just not the economics in it. If the assets that were being used as collateral had real lending value, real intrinsic value, because they were in-demand assets, then the collateral provider wouldn't give it to you in the first place. They would know it would have value and they'd use it themselves. Number one, there's no real value, even if you could work out number two, which is the operational aspects of it and be able to keep the substitution flow going unimpeded. So the, although there's in theory, six areas of impact, forget about these two. We're going to talk about these four that relate to securities finance and ETFs. Hope that all makes sense. Let's look at the different areas. So lending the underlying assets is <clears throat> pretty commonplace. That's what's in the ISLA figures. And here you talk about an ETF fund, or if you think about it, that's what mutual funds do or USIT funds do, right? They're lending the underlying assets. It's the securities that are make up that physically backed uh, ETF, whether that's replicating or uh, optimized in some way, goes out to the borrowers. This is just another stock loan, just another source for your securities to borrow. Collateral, again, all the same, although I think it's less common that the money flows back. Remember what I was saying? One of the things that some mutual funds do is they'll lend out of one fund, get cash collateral, and the agent lender will take that cash and give it back to the mutual fund provider who puts it into their money market funds. I think <clears throat> there is a lot less um, commonality. You don't really see that kind of self reinforcing cash flow activity. E ETFs. Um, just aren't are really engaged in the same way that mutual funds are. So that might be an interesting thing to think about. If you have organizationally, many of the mutual fund managers also issue ETFs. And it'd be interesting to see whether there was also this linkage that actually said that when this ETF lends and generates cash collateral, <clears throat> does it go into the mutual fund part of the organization? So that's a, that's an interesting question, which I will definitely ask someone. But look, this is just every other fund, nothing different, nothing unique, nothing riskier about it. However, I'll get to that in a minute. This is the relevant securities lending. Again, what we're talking about is ETFs perform part of this collective investment vehicle data where 19% of the securities on loan, according to the is latest ISLA report, 19% of the securities on loan belong to that community. <clears throat> And ETF are a proportion of that. And as I've said last week, a growing proportion of that. And I see that continuing to grow. So it's important to understand that's where this comes from. Now, the next part is lending the ETF itself. So this lending of the ETF itself isn't part of this data group here. Okay. So I don't think that's actually included in that because the ETFs that are issued and bought are bought by investors. So those investors can come from any community. They can be, they can be sovereign wealth funds. They can be insurance companies. They can be pension funds. They can be individuals. They can be anything. What they almost certainly aren't is other collective investments vehicles. So the ETF, when it's issued, isn't going to be part of that. That's where they sit as the investment managers and where they lend their assets from. But when the secure, once the ETF is in issue and the ETF itself is loaned out, well, that belongs into this wider universe because it could literally be anyone else other than these funds. Okay. So now that the ETF is in the market, <clears throat> You've got an opportunity that doesn't exist for mutual fund and usage because if as an investor, you buy a mutual fund instead, well, nobody's borrowing that mutual fund or usage fund to do a short sale because they aren't in and of themselves. They typically aren't transferable securities, right? They are interests 
in transferable securities, but they themselves transferable securities. So all of a sudden an ETF investor, they benefit from the underlying securities lending revenue that's generated by the ETF issuer to increase performance or reduce operating costs. Plus, they also get the advantage now that if they choose to, they can lend their ETF shares to end borrowers in the same way. So this is an incremental activity which doesn't exist for other collective investment schemes. Now, I get a lot of questions, people asking, oh, is it really of interest? How much demand is there? The guy, I think people don't realize just how much demand there is to borrow ETFs. I think in the US they do. I think in the US it's much more uh, commonplace to lend them, to borrow them, to use them as part of the daily flow. <clears throat> it's less common in Europe and it's even less common in Asia. So this area, I think, I encourage people to look at their portfolios see if they're holding ETFs and see whether their service provider lends those ETFs. Because if they don't, you talk to other service providers, because I think you'll find that there is interest in borrowing those shares and generating lending revenue for their owners. But again, just fundamentally, they trade in the same way as uh, any other security because the ETF is itself just a security. Now I'll, I'll talk about I'll talk about the risk. In fact, I'll talk about it now. So imagine you are an investor in an ETF and you've lent it out and you want to recall it. Now, typically you're not going to be voting. That's not the issue. You're not voting in the underlying assets. That's what the asset manager does. But you've asked for the ETFs back and the borrower says, oh, I can't really find any. Well, the truth is they can do what I'm going to show you in a moment. If there isn't sufficient ETFs in the market, they can make new ETFs. And so to me, the risk of recall is uh, somewhat reduced because of that, because that doesn't exist. If you've borrowed a million shares of Tesla and you recall it, and all of a sudden, for whatever reason, there's no other lenders of uh, Tesla available. You can't just make new Tesla shares, but you can do that with an ETF. So to that extent, it's a reduced risk. Now, sometimes people don't like ETFs outside the US because the apparent liquidity of the ETFs looks thin. Part of that issue is because, as I think I mentioned last week, in Europe, there you can have the same ETF listed on multiple exchanges. And what that does is that spreads the trading volume across most across multiple exchanges without really providing one single consolidated figure for the total amount of trading. And most people's internal data systems that collect the turnover and pricing information from data vendors will only have one home market for an asset. So you can't say, here's an ETF and you need to get volumes from the following three markets. It doesn't work that way. It, it looks for a primary listing. And so if there's a lot of turnover in a different exchange, that doesn't inc get included. And so that's a problem with uh, considering whether to lend ETFs, whether it's a position that can be covered, or if you're taking it as collateral, which I'll talk about in a minute. So lending the ETF in many ways is the same as any other security. But I would argue that in many ways, it's actually better. And of course, it's, an, it's a better alternative to making an investment in a mutual fund. If you have a mutual fund and an ETF that have exactly the same performance and no difference on expenses and no difference on taxation, then you are likely to be better off holding the ETF because you can also lend it out to generate revenue as an instrument in its, in, in its own right. Okay, so just think about that. Then you have this kind of unusual aspect to this. So this is like a mutual fund as well, because with a mutual fund or a use it, you can create new new securities every day. It's, they're called open-ended funds for a reason. The amount in issue can increase or contract on any given day. And so if there's say a recall or there's an opportunity for a loan, but there's no ETFs available to make that loan, 
then under the right circumstances or legally, operationally, you can do this. It's economically under the right circumstances. You can actually give the fund manager or the ETF issuer, whatever you want to call them, either the securities that are needed to create a new ETF or the cash equivalent or a combination of the two to say, right, here you go. Here's the equivalent amount. Give me an ETF. Take these assets, cash or securities or both, and create a new ETF. And so that's what happens here. That has to go through an, an authorized participant who interacts with the ETF issuer, gives the new, the new ETF units. Many authorized participants might also be prime brokers or investment banks. So they might do this internally. Uh, and so the assets might end up with the prime broker part of it, who can now make that ETF loan to their hedge fund client who makes the short sale. So this kind of creation to, to, to do a new loan happens you know, pretty frequently, right? There are opportunities and, and there always have been. And that's one potential, that's one potential thing. Pre Lehman, this was even, even easier to do because banks tended to carry more trading inventory and they were more likely to have a bigger proportion of the underlying assets of the ETF itself than maybe they are today. But still, this ability to create to lend not only gives rise to new lending opportunities, but of course on a recall, which I just talked about, this also allows a borrower to find a way to, to get the ETFs back to you. So if there's none available in the market, in theory, they can create some more and use that to return. So that's why ETF recalls are no worse than anything else with similar liquidity. And in fact, arguably, or even better because you can create assets if none exist. And of course this takes a couple of days, but nevertheless, it is possible, doable and gets done every day. Then finally, I talked about collateral being the linchpin here, ETFs as collateral. So. I quite like ETFs as collateral because they have so many interesting characteristics. So first of all, in fact, that maybe I've got these even out of order a little bit, I should really talk about the reduced exposure. So what do I mean by that? If I take uh, German equities as collateral in my normal securities lending activity, then on a day-to-day -day basis, and let's assume I do it through tri-party, the tri-party provider will say, what assets does Roy take as collateral? I've identified German equities as part of that. And at any given point in time, I may get one, two, three, five, ten German equities as collateral based on whatever criteria I put on, whatever my concentration limits are, whatever any caps or exclusions that I put on it. So I will have a number of German securities in my portfolio, but I can't say that it will be an, a weighting of X or Y. It could be any amount within my approval level. So I might be more heavily weighted to one stock than another, or I may have four stocks out of the index and not the 30 stocks that are actually in the DAX. And so I just get a random figure. And while that's still good quality stock, the truth is in the event of a counterparty default, I then have to figure out how much do I hold and what can I sell? And is that going to be representative of what's happening in the market? And what if the market seizes that? There's lots of issues. By holding an ETF that covers the DAX, that you have effectively an asset that replicates to some degree the performance of the DAX. And that's important because number one, it means that at the end of the day, you've got really effectively diversified collateral holdings across all of the DAX constituents, all right? Rather than the reliance on one company or two companies or five or however many you have. So that's one element of it. Then I want to bring you back into this. Let's say my counterparty defaults <clears throat> and I'm holding an ETF as collateral. Of course, I can sell that on an exchange. That's exchange traded funds. The clue is in, there. I can also <clears throat> sell it over the counter, right? Because you can always uh, do uh, deals with uh, counterparties. So I don't need to do it on an exchange. And in fact, many of the largest trades in Europe actually get done uh, between counterparties without 
doing it on exchange and then get reported afterwards. That's also one of the reasons why the liquidity data on ETFs in Europe is not really fully representative of the universe of trading activity. So I can sell it one way or another, or I can ask a, an authorized participant to actually redeem the asset. So I'll give them my ETF and say, you know what, you get me the underlying assets for that. So in theory, I can do that as well, because what I know then is now I know that I've actually got, I've actually got those shares coming to me. And if I can sell the ETF, I now have a diversified portfolio of securities, which I can sell. And my position in any one of those securities is going to be proportionate to their representation in the index. So I've now effectively, rather than relying on one, three, five, or 10, or whatever is available from the tri-party agent, looking at the borrower's pool of collateral, I now have a fully diversified DAX index as collateral, which I can go sell because I know I'm going to be getting the shares when I get that physically backed ETF redeemed and delivered to me. And in the meantime, what I can also do is since I know that I've got something that uh, performs like the DAX, I can also rather if the cash markets aren't working so well, I can sell a DAX future. And so by selling a DAX future, I've now hedged out my risk of holding that as an ETF. And it gives me another venue of a uh, disposal of assets. So as you can see, there are just many different options. Part one and two, of course, you can do that with any security, but three and four, you don't really get that. So to me, that's really important. And, and obviously I've talked about when there's collateral defaults, you want to, when you're selling collateral, you want to make certain that there is as little impact on the price of the assets you are selling as possible. And if you have a, a $10 million exposure, but it's spread across um, the, the 30 stocks and the DAX, your individual holding of any one of those is going to be relatively small. And so the impact that you have on market prices will be de minimis. Whereas obviously whatever's happening in the wider market is happening, but your own position certainly isn't going to exacerbate it. And so fundamentally you can, in some cases with enough hard work, find ways to use your mutual funds as collateral, but look, it's not easy and it's cumbersome and it's just not a mainstream activity. So ETFs are much easier to use as collateral because they are securities. Simple as that. So again, another advantage where if I have a mutual fund or an ETF that has similar performance, this is another value added as to why I might favor an ETF over a mutual fund. So really there's no extra risk of taking an ETF. If I'm, again, if I'm taking, if I'm taking assets that I'm already approved of, what I wouldn't recommend is that right now, if you don't take Chinese domestic securities as collateral, if that's not acceptable to you, I don't recommend that you take a Chinese ETF as collateral. Okay. It's really only about where you're already comfortable with the underlying asset. I think you should definitely be considering ETFs as additional collateral to approve. Okay. And there's now more data providers that make that kind of determination easier. So look to wrap up again, as we come up to the 45 ish minute mark exchange traded funds for the short interest side, uh, short selling and inverse ETFs are not equivalent one because the short selling an ETF gives you whatever the stock price movement is of the, of, of the underlying asset is, whereas an inverse one is a daily rebalancing of the index performance. And so is a percentage movement rather than an absolute figure. So they diverge over time. The vast majority of ETFs are physical, but synthetic volume and the role they play are both important and they're meaningful. And don't just look at it at a face value level, dig deep and uh, understand it before you draw any conclusions as to which is appropriate or risky or whatever judgment you're looking to make. And the six areas of impact really is only four that have a real impact. One is lending the underlying. So there it's like another collective investment scheme, like a mutual fund or a USIT, where you're actually looking at the assets that the ETF issuer has purchased with their issuance proceeds. 
and lending that into a normal market. But then there's also the lending of the ETF units themselves, which is incremental revenue for the, the creation of ETFs because these are, and it's also redemption. You can also redeem them, but I've focused on the, the creation aspect of that. But the creation of ETFs, which I see as an important risk mitigant in, in terms of uh, recall risk, as well as new opportunity, right? There's new lending opportunities all, all the time. And then finally, ETFs as collateral. Look, I talked, to, I haven't really explained why I talk about it as a linchpin, but if you think about it this way, if, and, and this is all about financing, right? So that's why I talked about securities finance rather than just securities lending at the start and in the middle of that, that little chart where I showed the six areas and the middle bubble is as securities finance, because to me, if you think if you are a prime broker and you have a hedge fund that wants to short ETFs, but they also, anything they want to short, they also want to be able to go long. And now a hedge fund has gone long an ETF. They bought an ETF. They want to sit and hold it long as a prime broker. One of your key obligations to your firm is to make it cost effective to hold these assets. And you need to go find someone to take it as collateral. And if, if you can't find someone to take it as collateral, then that's an expensive dead asset that's sitting in your books. So if all of a sudden I can find a bigger universe of lenders that will take ETFs as collateral, I now won't discourage my hedge fund client from going long that asset because I know that I can finance it. And so it should help mobilize more trading activity. And as much as the ETFs, the hedge funds might want to short ETFs, if they can't also go long ETFs, they're not really going to invest as much time in developing their trading strategies. So it really goes hand in hand. But if you mobilize collateral in the first place, then that kind of greases the wheels of the business and activity should increase. And so you'll see more lending of the ETF shares themselves. And so these final three start to have an, an iterative process that actually becomes self-reinforcing. So ETFs as collateral is really the thing that triggers the volume growth of these following activities. The lending of the underlying, I, I, did, my, I did my GameStop video last year, just over a year ago, I think it was March last year. And it was about how do you short more than 140 or more than 100% of the free float of a stock. I really use ETFs as an example as part of that continuum. I'll put a link to the, the video in, in, in the final edit here so you can actually see that. But anyway, I hope that was uh, of interest to you. As I said, next week, I'll put a video up. I'm not certain which, but thanks for the suggestions. Again, if you're watching this on a recording, I'm also interested in your suggestions there. I will hopefully be back from the border the following week and, and see you then. Thanks very much for your time and attention. Uh, have a great Saturday, have a great weekend, have a great week or two, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks again. Bye.